Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to tie up some loose ends on dividend assessment. If you think about where we are in this process right now, we've come up with a way of estimating how much a company can return to its stockholders, right? It's a free cash flow equity, a potential dividend. It's a cash left over after you've met every conceivable need. We've also looked at how much cash companies return to their stockholders in the form of both dividends and buybacks. And we said we need to compare those two numbers. Your company might be one of those very rare companies that returns its free cash with equity as dividends or buybacks, but most companies either hold back cash or pay out more cash than they've available as free cash with equity. The question is, what do we do with these companies? Your first reaction might be, if they're paying out less cash than they're available, we have to push them to pay out more cash. And if they're paying out more cash than they've available, we have to push them to cut dividends. Not so fast. To make a judgment on what to do on dividend policy, you need to look at four variables. The first, of course, is how much is your company returning to its stockholders in the form of dividends and buybacks relative to what it could have returned, the free cash rate equity. Do this not for one year, but for three, four, or five years. See if your company is a company that routinely underpays or overpays relative to its free cash rate equity. Second stop, remember what happens when companies hold back on cash? Free cash or equity, they, they don't return to their stockholders, their cash balance builds up, right? And a company that returns more than it has available draws down its cash balance. So second stop, take a look at the cash balance of the company, scale to the value of the company. Is the cash balance 3%, 5%, 10%, or 25% of the company? Third stop, take a look at the projects that the company has. Not just the quality of the projects, measured in terms of are these projects earning more than their cost of capital, but also the quantity. Does this company have a lot of projects or not that very many? And finally, look at whether your company <coughs> excuse me, is under-levered or over-levered. Is it the kind of company that's paying out, uh, that, that has a debt ratio lower than it's optimal or higher than it's optimal? Why might that matter? Because if you're a company that's under levered, remember you might want to pay out more than your free cash flow equity as dividends or buybacks because it draws down your equity and pushes up your debt ratio. And the reverse is true if you're over levered. Now, if you look at these four variables, there are, there are multiple combinations that can emerge for your company. I'm going to look at some of these combinations and I'm going to focus on the two most extreme scenarios where action is needed right away. If you're a company that is consistently returning less than your free cash flow equity as dividends and you've built up a large cash balance and you don't have very many good projects left and you're under level, look at all the ads. You're, returning you're not returning as much cash as you can. You have a big cash balance. You don't have very many projects now or in the future and you're under level. You need to increase your cash return right away. You don't have the luxury of time. Go out and return the cash now. What are you waiting for? At the other end of the spectrum, let's say you have a company that's returning more cash than it has available. Its dividends and buybacks exceed its free cash or equity. Its cash balance is small. It has good projects and it is over levered. Think of how much damage this company is doing to itself by sustaining a cash return it can't afford. It's getting more over levered. It's not taking good projects. This is the kind of company again where you need quick action and this time the quick action is stop returning the cash. So between those two extremes you have shades of gray. Companies which might be holding back cash where you're going to allow the company to accumulate the cash because it has good projects and you trust it with your cash. Or companies where you give the company the luxury of time saying you should return cash but you don't have to do it right away. And on the other side of the spectrum companies are returning too much in cash where you might say look you, you can continue to return this too much in cash because you're, over, you're under level and you want to push your debt ratio up. Or you might give the company the luxury of time again of adjusting slowly how much it returns to its stockholders. So let's look at six examples to illustrate the process. The first three are big tech companies. Amazon, Alphabet and Apple, they're all returning less than their free cash or equity. They all have big cash balances. They're all earning more than their cost of capital. Two of these companies are under level, Alphabet and Apple. Amazon, it's close to its correct debt ratio. The three other companies I'm going to look at are mature companies. Coca-Cola, Pacific Gas and Electric, and Panera Bread. Pacific Gas and Electric is a regulated utility. Panera Bread is a restaurant company, and Coca-Cola, of course, is a beverage company. Coca-Cola also holds back cash. Its cash return is less than its free cash rate equity. It is earning more than its cost of capital, and it's significantly under levered. 
Pacific Gas and Electric and Panera are returning more cash than they've available. Their cash return, dividends and buybacks exceeds their free cash flow equity. Pacific Gas and Electric earns slightly more than its cost of capital. Panera Bread earns less than its cost of capital. Pacific Gas and Electric is over-levered. Panera is under-levered. So a mix of companies. Let's see how we can use the tools that we've just developed to make a judgment on what these companies should do. So let's start with Amazon. Amazon is a company that does not return any cash to its stockholders. Either in the form of dividends and buybacks, it has about a billion dollars in free cash to equity. Over time, the company has accumulated almost $15 billion in cash, which is about 5% of its firm value. It's earning more than its cost of capital, and it clearly is on a growth path because it's entering new businesses right and left, and investors seem to trust it to find returns in these new businesses. So it has a free cash flow equity that is, that is obviously higher than the cash return. It's building up a cash balance. It has good projects. It also is pretty close to its optimal debt ratio. Now, would I push Amazon to return more cash? No, and here's why. I think the company will find good uses for its cash and its investment opportunities. And because it's at its fair leverage, I don't see any benefit to returning cash. In the case of Amazon, I'm going to say leave well enough alone. Let the company accumulate cash. Let's move to Alphabet. Alphabet also does not return any cash to its stockholders, either in the form of dividends and buybacks. It has a very large free cash flow equity, about $11 billion, and over time it's accumulated more than $100 billion in cash, about 14% of its firm value. The company earns well above its cost of capital, but there's a catch, and here's the catch. Almost all of its success returns come from its search engine. Every other business that, Google, that Amazon is invested in does not earn a positive return. In fact, they're all money losers. So its new projects, its new investments don't seem to be earning returns, though it's early in the life process, but they don't have a great track record on great, good investments. Finally, Alphabet also is significantly under level. So here we have a company that has accumulated a lot of cash, is continuing to accumulate cash, does not seem to have the golden touch when it comes to newer investments, it's under levered. My push here is, in spite of all of its success, I would encourage Alphabet to return more cash to its stockholders, either in the form of dividends or more if, if, it, if it's more comfortable with, with stock buybacks, in the form of stock buybacks. Let's turn to Apple. Apple is the greatest cash machine in history. I've described it as that before, and I'll describe it as that again. In fact, in the most recent year, Apple generated almost $60 billion in free cash to equity. It was trying to return cash. It returned more cash than any other company in the world, $31 billion, but that cash return was still less than its free cash for equity. Not surprisingly, Apple over time has built up the largest cash balance in corporate history, about $250 billion. So here's a company that has accumulated a huge amount of cash, is trying to return incredible amounts of cash, and still keeps building up more cash. The company earns more than its cost of capital, but here again there's a catch. Almost all of those excess returns come from one business, the smartphone business, and that business is getting to a point where it, Apple does not really need significant new reinvestment to keep it going. It needs to be technically creative to re reinvent itself, but in terms of capital expenditures, the business doesn't need that much. So the final question is, is it under levered or over levered? And Apple is under levered, it has debt capacity. So the greatest cash machine in history, accumulating huge amounts of cash, is incredibly successful in its existing businesses, but they don't need much capex and it's under levered. I would encourage Apple to return more cash and Apple seems to have listened. In fact, in its most recent announcement, Apple said it was going to try to become cash neutral. Now that a significant amount of its cash balance has been released by the tax law, I wouldn't be surprised to see some incredibly large stock buybacks and dividends from Apple in the coming year. Let's move to Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola returned about $9.3 billion in cash in the most recent year. Its free cash flow equity was about $12 billion. It returned less than it had than it had available as cash flows. It's built up a cash balance of about $20 billion, which is about 10% of overall firm value. The company is accumulating cash. It has accumulated a lot of cash. Not surprising, the company earns a huge positive excess return, about 12%, primarily because of its brand name and the, in the beverage business. But that business is starting to stagnate. Coca-Cola will continue to earn excess returns on its existing investments, but there aren't that many new investments to make. And finally, to top it off, Coca-Cola is under level. The case of Coca-Cola, as with Apple, even though they've been returning a lot of cash, I would encourage them to return even more 
because that cash really does not have much of a use in the company and by returning more cash perhaps they can move back up towards their optimal debt ratio. So those are my four companies that return less cash than they have available as free cash flow equity. Let me turn to the two companies that return more cash. The first is Pacific Gas and Electric. It returned more cash in the form of dividends and buybacks and it had available as free cash flow equity. Its cash balance was about 450 million. It's about 1% of firm value. So it's returning more cash than it's available. Pretty small cash balance. Its project quality is pretty neutral. Not surprising for a regulated utility because pricing is often based on whether you're making more than your cost of capital. It's barely making more than its cost of capital. But it does have potential investment opportunities, especially in green energy. And to top it off, Pacific Gas and Electric is significantly over levered. With a debt ratio of 36%, its optimal is 20%. So here you have a company that's returning more cash than it is available, has potential investments in green energy and is over levered. Here I would push the company to return less in cash. That's not going to be easy to do because many of PG&E's investors love dividends and to the extent that PG&E has to cut dividends, their reaction might not be positive. But for the health of the company, I think it makes sense for the company to cut back on the cash returns to stockholders. Finally, there's Panera Bread. <clears throat> Panera Bread, like PG&E, returns more cash than it is available. Its cash balance is about 3% of firm value, about $150 million. But here's where Panera deviates from PG&E. Unlike PG&E, Panera earns less than its cost of capital. Not surprising because the restaurant business, especially in the U.S., is incredibly saturated and very comparative. There aren't great investment opportunities left. And to top it off, Panera is also under-levered. So it earns less than its cost of capital, it's under-levered. It's paying out more than its free cash flow equity. Their first reaction is cut, cut the dividends. Well, in this case, you could actually argue that the company, because it's under-levered, should continue to return more than its free cash flow equity. Rather than cut dividends, I would argue that keeping those dividends high above the free cash flow equity might allow the company to move towards its optimal and it's really not hurting itself from a project standpoint because it doesn't have great projects. So with Panera Bread, I'm going to leave well enough alone and allow them to continue to return more than their free cash flow equity. So in summary, as you look across those six companies, the decision on dividends is not based just on comparing dividends to free cash flow equity. It requires you to look at the cash balance. It requires you to look at investment, quality and quantity, and whether the company is under levered or over levered. Then make your best judgment. And to top it all off, don't expect managers to listen to you when you give them this advice because dividend policy is driven by inertia. Managers love to continue to do what they've done in the past and getting them to change is really tough to do. Thank you very much for listening.